Hello folks and welcome to our game uh, brought to you by myself Shane Stelson and of course by Michael Verney and brought to you by orgoretro.com use the promo code our game and you'll get 15% off Michael I don't really want to do the show today but I suppose I'm going to have to take it on the chin aren't I I think you'll need more than 15% off that baby over there <laughs> over, over there this morning for people to buy it um so Jesus, what more would you want on a Monday morning awfully saved their division three football status um, my second county, Kilkenny, are in a league final, and Tipperary were well baited in Port Leash. <laughs> like, Jesus, well like, <laughs> what more do you want? Oh, Christ. I mean, right, will, will we just go straight into it? Can we believe what we saw in those two league semi finals? Don't get me wrong, very good performances from both Limerick and um, from Kilkenny. So, Clare won one, tw- sorry, Clare and, and, Kilkenny, and Kilkenny, Clare won 24, Tipperary 213. Kilkenny 317, Limerick 115. Can you believe what you saw with your own two eyes in these games? Now, I only got to see the highlights of Clare and Tip because it was covering Mayo and Monaghan, but I saw every bit of the game on Saturday. And that's the, probably the biggest takeaway. I couldn't believe what I was watching. I genuinely could not believe what I was seeing. There were mistakes that Limerick were making that were like so routine, handling errors that are just like nuts to a monkey to them on a normal day. It was bizarre what what I was looking at. Um, and like, it's not as if the like, Kilkenny were good, but they weren't brilliant. Or they were, I wouldn't even say they were very good. Limerick were just like, that is the worst I've seen them play in a long, long time. And I suppose that's, that's the unusual thing. Uh, and you can say that getting to a league final... And particularly with the idea of playing somebody that they're either going to be playing in round one or round two of Munster is not part of the plan. But they don't throw in a performance like that. Like, that's such a rarity. There was so many strange things going on in that game. It was bizarre to watch, really. It was, it was mad. It was like something from the pre-Kylie era. I thought, watching this Limerick team, just they look spooked on the ball. There's so many of their key players that you're like... He only pick up a hurley for the first time yesterday. And that's why I looked at their performance. And obviously, Tipperary were terrible for long spells of the game against Clare. And I was like, is this really the best that Tipperary are going to be able to produce this year? Which brings me back to questioning the entire thing. Now, I'm, we, we'll delve into those a little bit more, but we obviously want to get the comments going straight away. Gerard Ogo Grack on says, Tipper back to their 2022 form. <laughs> Christopher Conlon says they'll turn things around. And of course, Crack of the Ash, Limerick man, says thoughts and prayers with Christopher Conlon. Joseph Nash says, worst Limerick performance since John Kiley took over. The, the two top teams for the All-Ireland, along with Cork in the league final, uh, full of energy and goals. Going by Limerick sideline Saturday, John didn't look one bit worried. Limerick had zero interest in winning the game. Uh, come on, Shane, open the dressing room and let us out. Fellas mad to have a hop off each other and get stuck into it today. Well, look, we're, we're glad to get stuck into it. Um, which game? I think we should start off with Tipperary against Clare, seeing as it happened yesterday. You're going to go hard on me, aren't you? Well, <laughs> I go hard enough in the sense that, like, it was Jesus, like, um, for the quality of free takers, even that Tipperary have, like, that was some malfunction yesterday. Um, and you can write it off as you know, a bad day at the office, but it was a bad day at the office, you'd say, for probably three different free takers. Like, there's never, you just don't see Jason Four. Ford been moved off the freeze. Four. Four, sorry, yeah. No, yeah, but Sean Ryan was the, the fourth free taker, but you just normally don't, like, Jason Ford is usually. You know, one of the best ball strikers in the game. Garoto O'Connor wouldn't be a million miles behind him. Um, it's just, and then you look at the un, nearly unerring accuracy on the other side from Mark Rogers before he went off, and then from Aidan McCarthy who nailed some big frees into like what were tough conditions. Um, it was just, it was just very very strange to see it. Um, even some of the ball that that Tip were hitting in at times was that kind of even the passes at times were kind of there was no real conviction in it. It was kind of a loopy ball in on top of a forward. The one good ball nearly they got in was for probably for Jake Morris's goal. It was a lovely ball. As good as Adam Hogan is and as tight as he is, like there's nothing you can do when a ball like that comes in. But it was a real kind of rarity. The, the ball that was pinged out, I think it was from Brian Amar out to the middle of the field. So that was pinged, but that was kind of rare enough yesterday. They started unbelievably slow. They finished very poorly as well. Um, in the middle and after a half time was was decent and Sean Hayes had a goal got with only but haven't been only been on the field a couple of seconds but 
like overall, um, are oh, just disappointing. I'd say I'm very, very worried. There's no point in saying any different because you're so you are so close to the championship. But like I was kind of thinking about this. So Tip got an extra game having qualified, and there's maybe a bit of negativity around. Um, but there's also some of their frailties have been exposed. Cork didn't get an extra game, and they're just five weeks going into championship. Like sometimes you can nearly be it can nearly be punished for for qualifying for, you know, a knockout game in this kind of scenario. Cork are off working by themselves, but if Cork learned as much as Tip have throughout the league, probably, probably not. So, and I know Liam Cattle had a bit of a call to arms after and to keep the faith with uh, with Tip and that something is building. And up until yesterday, probably something had been building. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't completely write them off after yesterday, but there were definitely a lot of worrying kind of aspects to their play. Well, let's give uh, Claire all the credit that they absolutely deserved for this performance it was done without tony kelly without shane o'donnell without ryan taylor um, look we're not entirely sure when he's back without david McInerney. if you plug all those boys back in for championship or even for the league final i mean there is a question can they all gel back in straight away and get to the same pitch that these other lads are at but to do it without those guys and to see like the likes of Con cormac lean at the, is it connor or cormac lean? connor connor yeah connor, connor. Lean, yeah apologies like he stepped in nicely uh, Keith Smith had two points on the board after 45 seconds. Like, what a dream start for him. Um, they just had good performances all over the pitch. And when Mark Rogers had to go off, that Aidan McInerney would just slip in and knock over the freeze. I know you mentioned it already, but just let's contrast it here. Tipperary, with, with four takers, scored six out of 15 frees. And this is an eight-point defeat now. And after going down eight points to zip early on, this is this probably decided the game to a degree. Six out of 15 versus 10 out of 11 placed balls for, for Clare. And into that wind in the second half. And like the wind is important. We all know that like sometimes it gives you momentum at the start of the game. And I couldn't help but think of the Leinster club final that we lost to Owlert de Bala that time. Now, look, Owlert were the better team. There's no doubt about it. But on that day, in the first half, playing against the wind, Kula all at sea and Owlert made good on it. In this here, and look, it, it shouldn't be this much of a dramatic thing in the in a league game between inter-county teams, Tipperary were just all at sea early in the game. Just all at sea. And Clare were brilliant at working the puck outs. And they were working some down the flanks. And Tipperary didn't seem to be able to get out to those. And we saw, wasn't it, Adam Hogan sold it up to midfield and he was able to knock one over without coming near um, any, any tackler from maybe midfield or whatever it was. And then the long ones down were into space. Like the brilliant goal that David Fitzgerald got Hold on now, Shane, and it was a brilliant goal, but there is no way that if he turns his hurl to one side and the ball is flicked into the middle, that the whole thing should open up either. Well, well there, here's the question about, like, you know that I have question marks about who plays at number six for Tipperary, and I, I'm not sure that it's that Robert Byrne is the guy who should be there. He's got his qualities, don't get me wrong, but I'm just not sure that you need someone a bit more seasoned to command the centre and people would talk about, well, well, who's there? I mean, Seamus Kennedy getting injured has been a massive thing. And whether he plays wing back or wherever he plays, there's a knock-on effect now because Michael Breen came out and uh, he was marking David Fitzgerald and he's been having a brilliant season. But it didn't quite happen under that high ball. He, he sort of waited to catch the ball and David Fitzgerald was able to nip in ahead of him and obviously finished in, in completely brilliant fashion there. But look at the, some of the injuries that Tipperary are after picking up in recent weeks. Now, it doesn't totally explain away this non-performance, but to see Seamus Kendi, who's like very experienced, very composed, great use of the ball, Kendi is out. Uh, then you've got Owen Connolly, who had been probably one of the star turns for Tipperary throughout the league. He's been out. So just the knock-on effect, and then Cahill Barrett still isn't there. So we can look at Tipperary and say, right, they're all at sea heading into championship. And if you were to pick that performance in isolation alone and say, we're going to judge everything on this, Tipperary, they're all over the place. They're completely all over the place. Like, I, I was looking at it and I was wondering, what's the puck out set up here? Because they're not getting close to anybody on the short ones, and there's still space on the long ones. And, um, like, when you're up against that wind, I think you have to just sit off a little bit and be, like, if Claire goes short, you're drifting left and right, and you're not getting dragged out. You keep something of a compact shape because the long ones can't go into space. They just cannot. And you've got to have people organising the fence. And with Kendi out in the back line, and maybe you're rejigging things a little bit and bringing you know, Michael Breen out to the half back line, it just looked like a Tipperary team that was really out of sorts. But the upside is, much like Limerick, you're now far more wide awake to some of the things that you need to fix.
Well, I always think, I, I, I definitely think you're better off to get the eye opener. Would you prefer to get the eye opener now or in five week time? Five weeks time when they play Limerick, and like, there's a big difference between being, you know, you know, nearly shipping a double digit defeat in a league semi final, and that being a championship game where you're immediately on the back foot straight away and confidence is down. Um, I'd always prefer to find out what's wrong or find out what needs to be plugged or what needs to be changed rather than sleepwalking your way into the Munster Championship and thinking everything is okay. Um, and some of the time, like even like Tipperary in, in, uh, in 2010, like look at the, they probably thought they were in a great position after the 20, 2009 All-Ireland final and this was the team that was going to take down Kilkenny. Then all of a sudden, you know, Isaacy went to town and their defence was you know, completely reshaped and players were moved into different spots and they fell upon a fairly kind of a, a sweet spot, really. And they fell upon a team that ended up winning a lot earlier than the stop on a drive for five. So I'd always be of the opinion that it's better to find out what's wrong rather than thinking everything is perfect. But the only issue is, is that there was a lot wrong yesterday um, and not that much time probably to turn things around. But you know, it, it seems like from what John Kiley is saying, Limerick had been training very, very well and delivered a seriously flat display. From what Neem Cattle is saying, Tip were in, were in a good space and, you know, if, you know, the vast, vast majority of them didn't deliver anything yesterday. I, I, I tend to look at it through the league as a whole and what we've seen, like what we saw from Limerick throughout the league, you know, was, you know, good at times against Tip, good at times against Galway, you know, brutal on Saturday. But what's their goal at the end of the year to win six monsters in a row and be the first ever team to win, you know, an All Ireland five in a row in hurling? What's Tipperary's goal? Um, they would have liked to get to a league final. They would have liked to win their first league since two thousand eight. But their ultimate goal is to be in that tree, the Kamau Munster, and that is at the end of the day, that's what they'll be judged upon. Mm, yeah, K thirty two says Limerick were training very hard all week. No interest in league and gone to Portugal for weeks training. This morning, do you know? And this this would extend to both. Uh, well, actually, any of the teams that played in league semi-finals, you just wonder how much in today's world, given sports science and risk of injuries, and how many injuries every team is picking up. This whole notion of training the morning of a of a big match, I certainly don't think that that happens. But even flogging players, let's say on Thursday night, there if teams train on Thursday, maybe some of them train on Friday. Like, would you even train that heavily? Now, maybe you're, like, are you doing it within limits of what your S&C coaches or your sports science people will agree on? Like, we can't just explain it away as these teams did a heavy week's training, or, or is, in your experiences, could that actually be the case? Uh, I, I think it's an easy thing to say. Now, I know Anthony Daly will tell you that Claire did train the morning the league games back, back in the day. And it'd be totally maybe flat for a league game. Um, but I, I don't think that happens now because we're a hell of a lot wiser. Um, and I just think you're running a massive, massive risk by doing that. Yeah, the vast majority might be able to handle that load on that day and train hard and play the guts of a game. Um, but some lads won't. And you think you're getting, you know, what, what might be a long-term gain and you ended up with long-term pain of a, a guy been out with a, a soft tissue injury or whatever. But um, yeah, no, I... I I, I don't know. I, I don't know about the heavy load at the minute. Um, yeah, may, maybe, uh, maybe, and they start tapering down in, in a couple of weeks ahead of Munster. But that's kind of all kind of conjecture and hearsay. We don't, we don't know what's going on in out in Rakeel or down in the Gaelic grounds or wherever Limerick are training or wherever you know Tip are doing their bits and pieces. We don't know exactly how lad, hard lads are pushing themselves. It was just, it was bizarre to see how flat the two of them were in the space of twenty four hours. Very, very strange. Yeah, David Fitzgerald, like, scored 1-3 again. And you, you just know he has this capacity for explosive moments. And he could probably, like, it's not like he's in a game constantly over 70 minutes. Like, you look at some other players, and Ryan Taylor, he's always beaver and he's always on the ball. Will O'Donoghue, he's always doing something either destructive or working the balls with teammate. David Fitzgerald could go 20 minutes and not do all that much, and then all of a sudden... He's buried the ball into the back of the net. He's won the resultant puck out and put it back over again. If he has a big year, you know, he, he could easily be in hurler year category. And we, we talked about it for a long time. He's got that Austin Gleeson vibe to him as well, where he can just do something and bend the entire game to his will. Well, he's in hurler year form at the minute anyway. And as you said there, he's not going to be... He's, he's so explosive as well that 
Like you can't be making those explosive runs the whole way throughout a game. Like he, he's covering a lot of ground at times doing defensive work, but it's, it's not as explosive as when he gets the ball. Realistically, you can probably do what he does, um, exploding and through a tackle, probably maybe seven or eight times in a game. Um, and it probably is a, probably an element of recovering as well after that, and then going again maybe a couple of minutes later. But like, I saw him down in I saw him down in Wexford Park. I think he'd six shots and ended up with five from play. Um, he's put, he's racking up huge, huge tallies. And in that first four or five steps, if you're not right beside him or he gets the run on you, you are in big, big bother. But like, it's almost like he's taking that extra responsibility on his shoulders in the absence of O'Donnell and in the absence of Kelly. And even putting Duggan out in the wing on the wing as well, they have another kind of... And I mean, we, we always say this as a compliment. They have two good ignorant options on the wings if they're in trouble. And they have, they're have they probably both 6'4", six, 6'5", six, about 15 stone plus probably. And it's a great luxury to have that. I don't know. Part of me thinks that Duggan has been played inside for a couple of years as he acclimatised back to inter-county hurling and inter-county fitness. He's back at that now. He's at a stage where he can play. Uh, on the wing and probably consistently do what an inter-county half forward needs to do but they have those two options and yeah Fitzgerald is bringing some absolutely sparkling form uh, into summer and it just sounded as well Shano like Lowen has built like a new team here realistically like had, had, did you know much about Smith Lean you knew a bit about Daryl Lowen maybe before the, before the league started Keen Galvin like there's a hell of a lot of new faces after staking a claim and I'm not saying every one of them is going to start championship but they will be regular starters over the coming years and there will be guys that will be fairly battle-hardened and ready to come in and make a difference in championship games this year if they're not starting. They won't all be starting, but um, it's it looks like almost Brian Lone has built a completely new team. And as somebody said to me this morning, they haven't, you know, they're not, they haven't pulled any of the All Ireland minor winners from last year. They, I don't think actually they're eligible to play, um, and they haven't pulled a lot of the um, the vast majority of the twenties that have been good for the last two years. So there's a lot of new faces in there, and they seem to be acclimatising to senior to county hurling pretty well. Mm. Yeah, well, look, I go through that. You you've kind of taken the the sentiment out of my mouth in in the sense of the young players coming. Yeah. And then also Connor Cleary, like he just really does shore up that backline at all mm. times. He's so unfussy. It's a really... night though, It's not what you want. You want a lad that's not spectacular, and that's exactly no, no. what he is. Just like does his job. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then like you, you've got all these trusted lieutenants. Like Ian Galvin is going to always do something positive for you. David Reedy is going to do it. Carl Malone, even though like an unspectacular display, Dermot Ryan is growing into this more and more. Again, look. You know how I feel about the pot shots from 100 yards that Claire lads take, and sometimes he's guilty of it. But he's such a good player. Like, he really is excellent. And I'd say in another two or three years, this lad will just, you know, he'll be, he'll just be dominating games. And he probably already is to some degree. I've been so impressed with Daryl Owen. Like, he's so unfussy about his job in the middle of the field, and he's really, really combative. Um, like, it's like just the depth of this panel, what they're growing. Now, I think ultimately, you do need. Like every team probably still only has 18 or 19 lads that they're going to play in championship. And there's an element of shadow boxing in all these games. But just Claire are up there with Limerick at the moment in terms of that panel. They have to be. And if we're to just take, if we to ignore that league semi final in terms of its relevance for championship between Limerick and Kilkenny, it does still feel like Claire and Limerick one and two. And you know what? I might as well, might as well just remind people that we did a power rankings a couple of weeks ago. And while I initially did have Tipperary up there in third, I did adjust it and for a finish, Tipperary were fifth. And you know what? I'm not entirely sure after the weekend if they're still fifth. Where would you have them? Uh, it's a cost of a time bet- a kind between Tipperary and Cork, realistically, um, at the minute. Um, I kind of just think Cork kind of turned around their league a small bit. And I think Pat Ryan kind of has them where he wants to have them. And I don't know if he, he said he would, would have liked another game, but I actually don't know if he, if he would have liked another game. I think he's happy with where they are, get a lot of their kind of key men back fit and back humming for that first round. But do you know what's great about the weekend as well? You know, you, you get sick and tired of listening to all this BS about Munster hurling. And at the end of the day, 
the four in a row Leinster champions took down the four in a row All Ireland champions and took them down by eight points. And like you would, you you'll try and say you'll probably try and bring it up at some stage this summer if a result goes against Kilkenny. Will Kilkenny get out a monster and this kind of absolute wallop? It's just I, I don't know if there's been a weekend where more egg has ended up on your face than, than, that, than the weekend just gone. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? Actually, I I kind of ladle some of it on myself a, a training there on friday with the kilkenny lad there with the club and uh i was kind of laying it into him about kilkenny and stuff like that and then on sunday morning we had training and i got there first you know and i opened the gate and the first man in of course happened to be him <laughs> and he's giving me the fist pump out the window yeah, yeah. what can i do only take it on the chin but um yeah i mean look do, do you know to be what would trouble me a little bit if, if I was to really look into some of these performances and look at, okay, Tipperary last year against uh, Galway and Waterford, those two games that were very exacting in terms of like how the year finished up, you know, really dispiriting finishes to both of those games. And I look at the games that really mattered in the league this year, which was the Limerick one and also the one, of course, of yesterday against Clare. And the fact that Tipperary finished the game with 2 13. And even against uh, Limerick, was it 316 or something like that? Yeah. And I'm just thinking, you're not raising enough flags here, whether they're green flags or white flags. It, the goals are kind of keeping you alive. And having Jake Morris, like probably the premier goal machine in the country, it's paper over the cracks because if you score, and those four games that actually matter, they've averaged 18.5 flags being raised per game. That's just not going to do it. And I'll even compound that by saying when Tipperary got back to within three points, Conor Bowe's brilliant solo to set up uh, Sean Hayes for the goal. And then straight away after Jake Morris, sorry, uh, Jason Ford, he scored a free in the 37th minute. So it was back to within three points. For the rest of the game, both teams created um, 17 chances. Tipperary scored five of 17, which is ridiculously low. And Clare scored 10 of 17. So Tipperary had every opportunity to work their way back into the game. But it was just like, and I kind of asked myself, what is it that happened here? Was it like like a confluence of factors whereby, right, they're a little bit jaded. They came into the game thinking Clare didn't want to win the semi-final. And of course, you know, Tipperary are going to win it because Tipper, the team that ostensibly needs another game. And like Jason Ford just had one of his biggest off days on the tee. I mean, Sometimes people say, do you do enough from play as a free taker? But like, it was just total malfunction for him. Gerard O'Connor never got in the game. Jake Morris didn't get enough ball. And then all the workhorses. So Dara Stakelum, it just didn't happen for him at all. Connor Stakelum, really off day for him. And it's just across the board, it's like so many off days. And you're just relying on Connor Bowe's few bursts. And Willie Connor's playing quite well. And Brian O'Mara doing some good things. Yeah, it was just like the... Too many workhorses, Shano? But that, that is something that, that I kind of wondered about because, and like they brought in Sean Kennelly who like, you know, he's really talented and he got a nice point and, you know, so they tried to bring in a bit more with him and maybe like a, a line breaker in um, Sean Hayes. And uh, hold on have... now, hold on now. In the last 60 seconds, you've said off the tee because you were watching golf last night and line breaker. You need to relax now and pull the, pull the horns in and get the GA terminology back on again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, look, I'm not sure how you say that, but took on his man. He, he broke through a tackle. Yeah, he bet his man. Uh, and I, I no, I, it's a very fair point because it's something that that I kind of had looked at. I was like, okay, who are the scorers in the forward line? And you're thinking, okay, Jason Ford and Jake Morris. And I would have thought that Garrod O'Connor, who maybe that really busy schedule has caught up a little bit, and maybe the five weeks off now will will stand to him because he does look like a player tip have to hang their hat on. After that, you had Connor Stakelham. You had, uh, well, Dan McCormick was playing further back the field. Like, Connor Bowe was an attacker playing midfield. Willie Connors is an attacking type player. But there's probably not that many players who you think they could explode and hit six points from play here. Yeah. So, yeah. you could have a point there. Yeah, yeah, you could. Was it a bit strange that um, that the team was rejigged? Like, Bo has been wing back nearly all the league, and now he was, I think he was predominantly out middle of the field. Brian right. O'Mara, who I wouldn't know as a cornerback, would I know as a wing back or centre back, maybe even a full back. Was in cornerback. Like I, I thought they were peculiar moves now as well. Yeah, well, with with that and taking Owen Connolly out of the team through injury and James Kendi out of the team, it's kind of like they rearranged an awful lot of the furniture, and it just all came apart. So I think there might be an element of, of and also like you're, 
like you're also taking Cadell, who played the last couple of games out of the team as well. Like there's a big rejigging going on there. And is it any wonder that Claire pulled it apart? Do yeah. Do, do you know what's, do you know what's funny? That good or, or, or do you look at the, the shooting execution from Tipperary and like be like, what on earth is this? Are we going to see this again? Well, I'd look at the two winners over the weekend and I would say they were both good, but they weren't outstanding. It wasn't like a vintage Kilkenny performance, no more than it wasn't a vintage Clare performance. I think they just did kind of what they had to do. There were some kind of similar kind of parallels in the game as well. Like Clare just scored the freeze in the second half and kept ticking away. Kilkenny didn't score for from play for about 25 minutes in the second half the other day. Mm. They just kept stroking over freeze and uh, just kind of maintained that bit of a buffer that they had. But it's funny... This type of a game, um, the likes of a Barrett and maybe a Noel McGrath who are kind of waiting in the wings or not saying they were either, either of them were struggling to get their spot back, but you'll see it now. That sort of a defeat leads to significant change. And a Barrett who was maybe primed or mightn't have been far away last weekend or would be ready in a couple of weeks, he will be in because you just can't afford to maybe run the risk of what happened yesterday happening again. So you would be expecting um, a fair few changes. I, as I said to you there about the David Fitzgerald goal, I was just amazed that, that he was just able to kind of walk through the middle. And I know he struck it from about 20, 21 yards. But once he flicked that ball away into open space, and it was a very good puck out by Quilligan as well, and it's something they've been utilising, There's no, like he has to be met at the 45, and he has to be met again at the 21, realistically. Yeah. Oh, totally true. Totally true. Um... And even Mark Rogers, that time he got through for the goal chance. Like there was four goal chances in the space about five minutes. So Jason Ford blast one over the bar after Connor Stakeland set it up. He then did Ross... well to even get the shot away, Shane. Like to, to control the ball at such close quarters, and it was a very, very good. Save. He blazed over. I'm not sure if it, it was tipped over, but he did well even get the shot away. Ford did in that instance. Yeah, and then Rogers came through, and I thought it was poor defending from both Breen and Robert Byrne. Um, and Burn just needs to engage the man there. Like a six needs to engage the man. So look, that that would be sort of my concern there. But like you mentioned, Kilkenny keeping themselves in the game through freeze. You'd have to cr like Aidan McCarthy to come off the bench and knock his freeze like that on a day like that in the second half. Right, the opening twenty three minutes of the second half, Clare scored just one point from play. Now that was David Fitzgerald. Sure, like who else would it be? Only David Fitzgerald based on that performance, and that was after a great ruck was won by Keen Gavin. But McCarthy was just knocking over freeze for sport. And the only wide that they had during that period of time, the first wide that they had from a shot in the second half was the 61st minute. So in terms of economy of effort against a Tipperary team that was hitting anything but, you know, the two posts or in between the two posts, the only wide they had was an overcooked pass from Aidan McCarthy, which isn't really a shot at all. So you'd have to really credit them there for having that composure to... And they're the only unbeaten team in the country. Like, does Brian Lohan not want to win a semi-final, even though it's close to championship? Like, he'll want to win, won't he? Of course he will, yeah, 100%. And the fact that he's not, like, playing a full team throughout the league either as well. He's probably got eight, nine, ten starters, but he's got a lot of new faces getting, getting a chance as well. Will they... Like, uh, to me, the league final is uh, very interesting in the sense that, like, I know it's a league or whatever, but they do get a chance to win some silverware and maybe exercise a few demons against Kilkenny from the last couple of years as well. So I think it's perfect that it's not similar to last year as well. It's not two um, counties from the same province. There's no element, be no element on, of shadow boxing whatsoever. I believe from, from, this, from looking at the comments coming in there, the game is going to be on Saturday, April 6th. So as well, it makes sense to have it on the Saturday. Turles is what they're saying, even though that's not officially reopened yet, but hopefully it will be in the next couple of weeks. It makes sense to have it on the Saturday to give the teams another 24 hours as well and at least recover on the Sunday and then get back into training maybe two weeks from championship thereafter. Yeah, and ju just a final point on the accuracy that Aid McCarthy showed and Clare in general against the wind. Against the wind in the first half, Tipperary scored 8 of 17, 47%. In the second half, Clare scored 10 of 17, 58%. So they just... Like Tipperary's overall scoring efficiency was 42% compared with 63%. And if, if all of these chances were just ridiculous efforts from the sideline, you know, I'd be just saying, well, look, that's just poor decision making. It was, it was just awful shooting. There was times when, obviously, we mentioned the free tech, and that was dreadful. But Connor Stakelham, 
uh, Sean Hayes, they had chances from like 50 yards out in front of the goal, not being tackled, and they were missing these chances. So that's why I'm like, okay, I'm not sure I'm ever going to see Tipperary as bad again. But maybe, maybe I'm rationalizing and, you know, kind of trying to put a brave face on it after such a bad performance. Yeah, well, listen, you know I, I'd love to hammer you, and I will hammer you to a certain extent. But, like, if you look at 2022, Tip had a bad league, and it was a series of underwhelming performances that led into a very, very underwhelming championship. So Tip have had some good performances um, at times throughout the league. The Galway game, they were you know decent against Limerick for a period. Um, they were good against Dublin the first day out. Do you know what I mean? You're not carrying... Like it, this was a bad performance yesterday, but you, you don't just put a line through them and say, you know, that they're gone or they're not going to get out of Munster now at this stage. Not saying they have that much credit in the bank, but they haven't been playing really poorly up until this. They've been playing fine up until this. Um, and I think you could kind of see the, the disappointment on Liam Cattle's face because, like I'd say, he was going going home for a league title, and I'd say he's left scratching his head this morning wondering. Um, wondering kind of what's happened or what led to such a flat display. And they're going to have to sort it out within within the next five weeks because that Limerick game, um, on the, I think it's on the 28th, that's, a, that's huge. Like, uh, like whatever, whatever about getting a result, how they perform that day will basically underpin how, you know, how they get on in Munster thereafter. If they ship a defeat like they did yesterday in the first round, they're in big, big butter. Yeah, Adrian McGrath, Clareman, looking to sew the boot in. To be honest, I don't blame him either. Tipperary, six and seven points down, had 12 players in their own half at times, and nobody inside Clare's 45. It was a joke, a shambles. I suppose also, like when you're playing with such a strong wind, you've got to be clever on the ball, calm on the ball, and, and run it through the lines. If the opposition hasn't come out with you, and you leave one or two inside, then you should be able to deliver it into... Like in the first half, you'd feel a little bit sorry for the likes of Bader Matter in there because if the ball has been delivered up, it's going to hold up, it's going to be slow, you're going to have a defender up your backside, and then you're, once you do actually, if you do get the ball, you then have to try and turn and run against the wind and try and somehow get get a score out of nothing. But Claire That's what I'm saying, Shane, oh, about the quality of ball that was going in. It was, like, it was not good ball. It was not ball that was been pinged or driven in. You know, it was kind of hanging, and even if a forward does win it, you're not taking it with any degree of speed or momentum, and you're taking it in a position remember you used to always say about uh, for a couple of years there um where Seamus Canlon was picking up the ball like picking up the ball out near the sideline for Tipperary which is like there's so much you have to do from there and there was an element of that yesterday when the ball did go in um and like that's not what I think of when I think of tip at their best I think of lovely crisp diagonal ball going in that's real advantageous to a forward if he wins the ball he's probably taking it and he's nearly at, gone at his man nearly straight away whereas that wasn't the case yesterday maybe outside of the Jake Morris goal that was the one time where I think it was Brian O'Mara pinged it to Dan McCormack and I haven't seen Dan do this that often but the ball he gave in was beautiful like it took Adam Hogan out of the game it was out to the right hand side Morris did that lovely little fake off the hurl and turned back inside and there's nothing a defender can do but those sort of balls in were few and far between yeah, Ian Donovan, I was at it. Let me say, Claire were immaculate in possession and they have to get all the credit. Uh, that's from a tip man. Uh, Bryson Peters says, tip are pathetic, lads. They're so overrated. Do you know what I'm loving? There are so many uh, comments in today from names that I haven't seen before. <laughs> Let's keep it coming. Can't believe Shane thinks tip would beat Kilkenny, says Bryson Peters also. Uh, it's official now, Thurless, says River Power. Now, I just want to remind you that we're brought to you by orgaretro.com. Use the promo code OURGAME and you'll get 15% off. Huge amount of brilliant jerseys, zip-up tops, old-school jumpers, the whole lot there. And by the way, follow us at patreon.com forward slash OURGAME. There's a load of two-minute tactic videos, two audio podcasts a week. You're going to have written columns from both games over the weekend and the audio podcast from every show also, uh, coaching clinic videos. So anything else you want to say on that game? Have we gotten through enough in 34 minutes? <laughs> yeah, um, and you have to do it all again, like the post mortem once again during Tipcast during the week as well. So good, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, myself and uh, and Shane Brophy will definitely be doing the post mortem. That'll be on Wednesday. We'll move on to the Kilkenny victory of your Kilkenny team beating Limerick. What did you think of it? What did you make of it? Just on this quickly, because Conor Heaney has mentioned it twice. 
Um, didn't Verney say that there was trouble in the Kilkenny camp last week? That was what I was, I, not necessarily trouble, but it, I was led to believe that there was um, some disharmony. Um, and listen, I, what I was told was from a fairly reliable source that it wasn't a happy camp. They looked pretty <laughs> looked pretty happy last Saturday. Definitely coming off the field around six o'clock anyway. So that, that could be rubbish. And it was probably... And to be fair, it was probably a bit loose of me um, to even put that out there at the time without properly checking it out. And so I'll, ho- I'll hold my hands up on that one. Yeah, loose lips. Um, Sink ships. <laughs> loose lips, yeah. Maybe we need to be a bit more like Johnny Tight Lips from, from now on. I ain't saying nothing. But, uh, <laughs> like, I, I'll put it this way. What's funny, I think there's several interesting things about that game on Saturday. When Limerick went 1 2 to no score up, like, what are you thinking? Limerick oh. are going to win, but Limerick are going to win by 8 or 9, and this is just like clockwork. Well, we had Owen Larkin on the show last Friday, and like, understandably, because I was thinking the same thing, he was like, you know, you'd be worried a little bit about a 10 point loss here, which again comes back to can we believe what we saw? But I mean, there's a lot about that Limerick performance, no more than tip, that stunk. You know, you, you look at, go through it, right? The main players, the, the guys that we've hung our hats on over the years, like Nicky Quaid in goals, didn't look his normal self. There was a couple of times he ended up like almost diving around the yeah, ball or even yeah. on the ball. And you're like, that's not him. Barry Nash, look, he's a player that we have just kind of written songs about nearly at this stage. But I've never seen him play like this. He looked, I mean, he looked all over the place for him. And, you know, I mean, let's not take this as an insult rat like that. I mean, he's such a good player. I was like, what on earth are we seeing here? Like mistakes, getting turned over, getting being made look like a converted forward, actually. You know, at the time he was pinned by Owen Cody for that lovely goal. He got pinned too easily and spun too easily. And I was like, is this like when you don't have Mike Casey back there sort of organizing the show? A bit like Tipperary missing Seamus Kendi. And so you don't have the main man who normally orchestrates back there. And Sean Finn clearly isn't right either. Then all of a sudden, you're, you're, you have to be the main man defender, even though maybe you're more of a forward. So that's how it kind of looked to me. Dermot Burns off the boil from the get-go, like simple spills. Declan Hannan looked a bit stuck to the ground. Keen Lynch, from his first run, when he kind of ended up being unseated and overrunning the ball, you're like, he doesn't look like he's running like himself. And then he was turned over for the goal for, for TJ Reid. And he was just run off the road. And I was like, these lads don't look right. Will O'Donoghue was good. Carl O'Neill was really good. And beyond that, I was like, what am I watching here? Yeah, no, it was very, very strange. I, I cut out that clip um, in the first half where I think there were like eight mistakes in the space of about like 15 seconds. I think Adrian Mullen ended up putting the ball over the bar. But that was one of the times you mentioned there. Hannon kind of spilled it around the goals and Nicky Quaid looked at C. And it's so, it's so weird to see it. And then they grabbed control of, of possession again and then they fumbled it again. And like it was weird. I remember looking at Barry Nash going to pick up a ball at one stage and you kind of half alluded to this earlier that like it did look like he hadn't held a hurl or something. It was really strange. And there were burns as well and they were popping balls off the shoulder. I remember Cotton O'Neill popped the ball to Hannon off the shoulder at one stage and Hannon was just too close to him. Like it, it wasn't on. He was like a yard away from ball spilled. Just some very, very strange stuff. Like when was the last time you saw um, Aaron Costello was one on one with a long ball in. Owen Cody was one on one with a long ball in. Sean Finn was one on one with a long ball in. Just there was no one. Uh, there was no one covering back. It was just very, very strange. And I think you obviously have to give Kilkenny plenty of credit. And the fact that uh, they looked in trouble earlier on and were one two to no score down. Um, and it looked like Killian Buckley was in a bit of bother. He was turned over a couple of times, early doors. Billy Ryan missed, missed a kind of half goal chance where he scooped the ball off the ground. It was a good goal chance. Shane Murphy had a wide. And then Kilkenny didn't score until TJ Reid got free in the ninth minute. And then like Limerick were only able to score four more points in the rest of the first half and didn't actually get that many shots away. A couple of missed frees and Galan missed a free around 55 yards out straight in front of the goals. That was just really, really strange. You, you, just, you just wouldn't see it. Um, but it was a bizarre, it was a bizarre game to look at. And just on Sean Finn as well, um, like, and we obviously rate him unbelievably highly, but like to me now, he was not running right. He, like, we, they're a month away from playing championship and I would have you know serious concerns. I, whatever about one of our viewers there says that he was unsure of himself, I thought he was unsure of his leg, genuinely. And I look back on seven or eight different clips where he was 100%. There was definitely no knee drive in that leg anyway. It looked like he was kind of carrying it. But like he didn't look right, but he clearly was right. Or what he's been doing in training was 
you know, he was deemed fit to play or whatever, but um, he's a lot of gears that he's going to have to get up to over the next while. But I, just, I, do, I, I worry about whether he's actually 100%. Um, lads recover from Crucians differently. Like David Burke got back in jig time. Bernard Brogan got back in jig time. I was only saying this to someone yesterday. Sean Finn is he's not like overly big, like he's five ten, I'd say, but he's a huge man. Like he's mm. you know a lot of muscle mass on him. Um, and maybe it's going to take longer. Like the right and saying Virgil Van Dyke wasn't right the first year coming back after his cruise. Shit. Is it only can it? Then was it only the next season, which I think is this season, that he actually got back nearly one hundred percent again? Maybe that's the case with Finn as well. And then you had Barry Nash was unsure of himself. Um, Aaron Costello, with due respect, was very unsure of himself and like was caught in possession uh, and was kind of caught badly by TJ for that high ball as well. So, but there, there were there was a lot of lads unsure of themselves. Yeah, it was just so odd, and you just think Mike Casey went off against Galway. What looked like a concussion issue. I mean, I'm think basically the way he was ambling off that's what i thought it was and if he doesn't come right quickly that would be a huge issue and he didn't seem to take that bad of a dunt but obviously look the brain you know the way it works it doesn't maybe it doesn't necessarily need to be a bad dunt but they're missing him i understand fergal o'connor was the, was the same shane that 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 was a that was a hia from what i'm led to believe as well so that well, was two lads that were missing as a result you know and you can't blame teams on really minding their players i mean of course they are especially when it comes to something to do with the head but if you plug into that team, and these are more likely the starting players, but Dan Morrissey, if you throw in uh, Mike Casey, I feel like there's another few players missing. Darryl Darryl Donovan. Donovan. Seamus Flanagan would probably be a starter. And I feel like there's one other player that I'm not thinking of off the top of my head. But there's a lot of players that you can plug into that team. And all of a sudden, Kyle Hayes. Kyle Hayes, is yeah. Arguably the best player in the country. I mean, that totally changed the team around. However good or bad Tip were, and they were bad, it's not like you've that sort of quality to plug back into the team and have a month to get it all right. Tip have the time to get it right, but you don't have the time to gel all of that quality straight back in, that proven All-Ireland winning quality. Yeah, I'd say there's nothing sure than Kylie will go back to the well with pretty much the same faces. Like, Would you be that surprised if... If they're all available, that the same fifteen players that started the All Ireland will start the first round against Tipperary. I'd say the the only mm, outside of maybe Cottle O'Neill, but that'd be interesting to see where he fits into the jigsaw if Kyle Hayes is back fit. Like O'Neill and O'Donnell are the I would say the only two maybe threatening to start, unless there is you know a problem with Sean Finn and maybe Fergal O'Connor could squeeze into the corner potentially. But I I'd be fairly confident that Kylie will go back to the well with the same soldiers once again. And and actually this feeds into a broader point that like you might look at the the Limerick four in a row team that you know won completed it last year and obviously started it back uh, completed it mate. Completed it mate and started <laughs> from 2021 to 2023. And you look at the Kilkenny team 06 to 09 to four in a row the teams remained at pretty constant throughout there, there was probably a couple of changes in terms of starters at the beginning and end of those runs. But Limerick's team isn't just that four in a row team. It's the team that won back in 2018 and beat Galway in that final. I'll read out that team and you tell me how many of these uh, you reckon would start if fully fit this season. And we'll see what the turnover is like. So Nicky Quaid and goals, Sean Finn, Mike Casey, Richie English, Dermot Burns, Declan Hannan, Dan Morrissey, Darrow Donovan, Keen Lynch, Grode Hegarty, Kyle Hayes, Tom Morrissey, Aaron Galan, Seamus Flanagan, Graham Mulcahy. Now, how many of those players do you reckon? I mean, obviously, Richie English doesn't see. I, I presume there's an injury or something like that. And Graham Mulcahy, he's only just coming back from the cruise, yeah. And Graham Mulcahy seems to be more used on the bench these days. But I've thir- that- I've thirteen, yeah, thirteen was what I had. I used very quick abacus on my hands as you were flying through them. But thirteen was what I had. Um, even though I, from what I've seen throughout the league, Flanagan is one of the more likely of the usual suspects to miss out just he probably hasn't excelled throughout the league maybe like he normally would and it look, i think they might go with odalic for for the for the first round but they, I, as, oh i'd I'm, be very surprised especially when things aren't going right i think you go back to someone and look that's not to say he's not an excellent prospect but you go back to what you trust don't you yeah you do but just uh, we probably haven't taken into the the caveat of like unless they appeal and successfully successfully appeal, Peter Casey will be missing for for the first round. And 
Uh, we might get into it. I wish we could get into it now if we want, but there was there was a there was a couple of red cards at the weekend that I just thought were totally unwarranted. Now I have to say the Peter Casey one was warranted in my in my opinion. That was a nasty enough slap. That wasn't a flick. Owen Cody's was a flick. Um, Jake Morris's was a flick. A flick on someone's hand that was unprotected. Um, with the ball in very very close proximity. So to Actually, me, just on that one, uh, Michael. Didn't Willie Connors, did he, I'm not sure if he got booked, but he definitely, um, let me just double check, did he get booked? Yeah, not entirely, at a glance there, I don't think he got booked, but he had a free given against him, or else somebody got booked for tapping on his hand, but again, it wasn't protected. So like you you do have, to, I've had my hand broken through not protecting my own hand. In fact, I've often had people saying to me, I don't, or hadn't protected it enough anyway. You have to protect your hand. So that was a very harsh one on Morris, and I agree with you. On Cody's, the referee can make a case for both yellow cards, but it just doesn't feel like enough to send a player off. Ah, no, like there, there has to be a bit of discretion in it as well. Do you know what I mean? Like that's like I didn't actually see what he got the first yellow for, and it wasn't it wasn't caught on camera. He looked upset by it, but like that was like Declan Hannon didn't like make any meal of it or anything like that. It was just a kind of a play on. There ha- I think there has to be a bit of discretion there, particularly when the lad. I t- to me, and I know you say, you might say, well, you can't treat lads differently if they're on a yellow, but to me, you, you kind of have to, you give them a tick and you say, listen, one more foul and you're you're gone here. But that's not well, What you have players coming up then, you know, if they're about to get a yellow card pointing, hey, down the field, you didn't give that lad a card, so... Okay, okay. The, 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 the solution is to not give a yellow for that at all. That's the, that's the solution because to me that's not that's not a yellow card. And I remember saying to you before, I was a while ago on another show, remember a fella put his hand up like that, like that, basically, to catch a ball. And the ball was actually in his hand. This is under 16 hurling years ago. And I pulled full force on the back of your man's hand. And the ball actually went about 40 yards down the pitch. No joke. And I'd say I could have broken every knuckle in your man's hand. And I remember thinking, just fair play, ref. I pulled exactly where the ball was. He didn't protect his hand. There was no free. And like to me, it, you, des- you deserve a tap in your hand if you put your hand up unprotected. You're not going to try and break someone's hand. But I wouldn't have been punishing Jake Morris in that instance, no way. No, and yeah, I suppose, look, Peter Casey can't have too many complaints. Generally, a, a flick like that isn't going to cause too much damage. But if you're just letting away all sorts of flicks, you know, ultimately, you know, you're going to end up with a lot of people with broken hands. So yeah, that has to be knocked out. The, the flip side is, was he being wound up by Paddy Deegan? I thought it was actually gas TJ Reid making a bit of a joke about it in the post-match interview, saying he got a little tap, got a small bit of blood there. So I enjoyed that. Peter and Casey, once he realised he was caught as well, <laughs> tried, tried to make out like he was after being badly hurt, and he definitely wasn't. Yeah. I, and did, did you notice in the first half, was it was it maybe Cahill O'Neill who went down? Like, there's this new thing now that if you take off your helmet, you have to go off the field to play, go to the midfield uh, line, and yeah. then you're going to get brought back by the referee. Did you notice that he was taking his helmet off and the physio told him to put it back on or the doctor? Yeah, and Will O'Donoghue wanted to take off his body warmer and had to take off all the other paraphernalia and ended up having to go to the sideline as well. So I think lads are... I think like that's fair enough. Like, it'll, it'll cut out some of the messing. Well, it will cut. That's a bit annoying now because he wasn't trying to waste time or do that. He's just trying to... You know when you're overheated, you're cold starting yeah, a match and then you're overheated. Like, it, in a warm-up, you're going to get so warm that you need to take it off anyway. Like, everyone knows that, like, come on. Look, it's your own fault if you didn't take it off. Well, I'd say that part of it was, am I right in saying that that rule was only been enforced from last weekend onwards? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, from, yeah, from so that morning. The, you won't have lads doing it from, you won't have lads doing it from now on. And it's like anything, if you risk being off the field for a couple of seconds or anything like that, you just, you just won't do it. And he'll grin, he'll grin and bear his, his Under Armour till half time or whatever, or he won't wear one next time at all. But lads are going to be ultra careful about taking the helmets off now, which I suppose is why the rule was brought in in the first place. And obviously, you were roaring Kilkenny on from pillar to post. What impressed you most about your boys? Do you know what? I wasn't like I wasn't blown away or anything. That was the Stop kind of trying room. to play it down now. Come on, I know they're your team and all, but <laughs> I wasn't. No, I was far from it. Was a good Kilkenny performance. I thought. Like I, I don't know, was Keen Lynch wearing shin guards as well, which I thought was really no, interesting. No, no, no. He's he was wearing those calf socks, from what I can see. Do you remember okay. Luke Connolly had uh, the car yes. football had problem, and I think he was wearing those as well. And it feeds into the what do you want to call it a narrative or a suggestion or a feeling that he's just not moving right. And I don't know, is it all the injuries and all that? Maybe he'll come back. You know, we think he's unbelievable, but like 
he's obviously not moving perfectly at the moment. Yeah, and he had the old kind of the old O'Neill socks pulled up like they were a classic. Like you do well find them in a shop nowadays because they're all ankle socks now. But uh, he was totally nullified by by Jordan Malai, and that's like Jordan Malai hadn't played a league game since I think he he break his hand the Tuesday night after the Wexford game in the opening. He was brilliant. Like, he? he was he really was, good. He was brilliant now, but like. I, I wouldn't be fooled. I wouldn't be fooled by, and I don't think uh, I don't think Derek Ling will be either. Like at the end of the day, they had a fair bit of inexperience on the pitch. Like they still had a really inexperienced midfield in Keane Kenny and Jordan Malai. Now they fought very hard, but I, I don't think he'd be under any illusions to think that he's going to necessarily get away with that midfield in all the games for the rest of the year. But um, I, if I you just were like told before the game that Keane Kenny and Jordan Malai would would have the edge on Willow Donahue and Keane Lynch. Now, to be fair, Donahue was, was a bit better, especially in the first half. You wouldn't have believed it. No, I wouldn't have believed it. I would have been very, very surprised, to be honest with you. I would have been very, very surprised. And it was so unusual to see. Kilkenny's response to that 1-2 was they actually got 2-2, I think, off the next four possessions. Um, and sometimes, and I've said it to you before, sometimes the ball does the ball doesn't need to be perfect inside the whole time. Like Owen Cody's goal, the ball was just lamped down actually on top of him. But he mm. was one but he was one on one. So you're you're still giving you know a 50-50 chance. The ball in for um even Luke Hogan's reaction from Quaid's save. That's like that's unusual that there, it was a Limerick player next to the ball. I think just from a Kilkenny point of view it was probably just the endeavour and how they kind of clogged up around the middle um and how they were the ones that actually um had lads given good ball in from the outside and like there was a couple of times I remember even seeing Groan Hegarty was kind of throwing his arms up in the air trying to get close to a fella but he was five yards off the striker putting the ball in and putting a lovely ball in which is just very very strange because like and even like Tom Morrissey was very very quiet by his standards and we didn't see him up and down the wing like we normally would um Shane Murphy is mentioned there by Richard Hogan as well like, Shane go. Murphy Shane Murphy slipped in corner back the other day but they was, knew that he'd be like he was marking Adam English, who was like a traveling uh, yeah. forward. So it actually suited perfectly, and he caught a puck out at one stage over English, and it kind of really set a tone. Yeah, it did, and he's a, he's probably been one of their players in the league as well. And like at the minute, like pre- pre- presumably performs fairly well in the league final. Um, he's a great chance of starting probably for championship as well. I'm very very impressed with him. Just going down to a couple of notes here. Um. Like I couldn't believe how how often Kilkenny opened them up, and even uh, I think you tweeted about this. Even TJ going for the goal, there are times where I think you do go for the the throat. Um, and I know I know it was saved. Now they were, Limerick were blessed that 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 ball was saved. Nicky Cade kind of half stopped it, and it like it hit off Barry Nash's leg. Are you so sure like hit Costello on the way to hitting Nash. It could have, maybe it was Costello, but Nash was blessed, like, and mm. even when the ball dropped to Nash, it was like two or three times to get into his hand. It was just really, really strange. But uh, I think that was the right move by TJ. It was a bit of a sign of intent um, that they, they had goals in their mind, and they could have had five, re- realistically. Um, and the fact that they, you know, they were expecting that third quarter onslaught from Limerick. Oh, and Cody gets sent off, and you're kind of thinking, "Oh, it's maybe it's building now, and Limerick will come." And to be fair, Limerick never really looked like winning, even though Limerick were the ones that were scoring from playing that third quarter, and Kilkenny were relying on freeze. They always kept them at arm's length. Um, I don't think they'll be deluded by the winning margin or anything like that. I think you have to take it with a bit of caveat of like, this is probably the worst Limerick performance we've seen in a long time. It was far from a vintage Kilkenny performance, but it was an important win um, against a team that's beaten them by what? 11, 9 and 2 points in the last three times they've met in two All-Ireland finals and league final. So it can definitely be no harm for a lot of those young fellas in particular to get one up on them. Yeah, and you know, I've made the point several times over the last four and a half years that you don't need to collapse when you go down to 14 men. And obviously, you know, at times maybe it was a little hint towards Kilkenny. They did not collapse with 14 men here. They didn't have to collapse in the 2019 All-Ireland with 14 men. So that was hugely to their credit that they kept going even though they lost the guy that I would say is their leading man in the forward line. And people say, oh, 14 is the only place for TJ. And to some degree it is, but it, it, to me it seems like he moves in and out depending on how he's feeling during the game. He's 36, he's not going to 
do a hundred, you know, kind of massive sprints over the course of the game. So he's managing his own energy well. From what I can see, he's playing really well, and he was taken off after an hour ish or whatever. But Owen Cody is the main man on the inside now, the constant threat, the outlet, and I, like to me now, he's he's just at the absolute top of his game. But Kenny could have had ten goals. A couple of the chances were half chances. We look at the ones that Limerick had. And the, the goal that Aaron Galan got and was finished really, really nicely and the ball was popped onto him. I can't remember who popped it onto him. But actually, it initially came because Barry Nash mishit a free from his own back line. And it was just yet another thing. I was like, what's happening here? And this is after four minutes. It just seemed strange. Um, but anyway, look, that was their one real goal chance. And there was another half chance when Dunica O'Dolig was blocked by Hugh Lawler. But even that, he was totally surrounded by men. So it wasn't a full goal chance. So it was like 10 goal chances to, to one, really. And again, a couple of the Kilkenny ones were only half chances. But even remember like some of Nicky Quaid's puck outs in the first half, the one that Jordan Malai caught and pumped it back into the area, or maybe someone got a point off it. It was just like everything that Limerick normally do well. All the sort of system stuff, you know, where everybody knows yeah. the position where they're shuffling over and back pressing as a unit, working so hard. It was like Kilkenny flipped the script on them. And one of the most impressive things for me from Kilkenny, never mind the goal scoring chances they created, was the discipline in their tackling. Now, okay, fine, it wasn't Limerick at 100%, but the way they got bodies around the man and didn't just go in and overdo it and give away a silly freeze with that you know, lazy tug or whatever. They got in close, they got arms and legs everywhere, and they just frustrated the life out of Limerick. And it's Limerick will never play this bad again, you would imagine. Or, or, or are the miles on the clock adding up? I don't think they are just yet. But there's a template laid down by Kilkenny in this game. A bit of a one, yeah. And we probably talked about um, maybe Sean Lennon last week, you know, maybe annoying a couple of Limerick lads. I would definitely say Keen Kenny was was annoying Will O'Donoghue. And there was a couple of them. They, yeah. had them, they had them a bit irked, like they had them off their game. You, you know, in, I, you've been in the situation, I'm sure, where just an incident or a fella just does get under your skin. Um, it, it doesn't happen the next time you play him because you're kind of ready, but there's, there was just instances in the game where you could just see that it was kind of uncharacteristic even of O'Donoghue. He was just annoyed. He was be, he was being annoyed. Did um, Kenny chop on his head at one stage and give away a free? <laughs> no. Guy, that, 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 that's true now. He, he did all right, but it was but there was other bits and pieces. But he was and getting fair, stuck in. There was like yeah. a sideline at one stage. He was nudging in and like, you know, he's tiny by compare, compared with Will O'Donoghue, but fair play to him. He didn't back down. No, he threw himself around, I would say, because, like, there was several pictures of him going around. Like, O'Donoghue probably has uh, four to five inches in height and probably 10 or 15 kilos on him, I'd say. But he was, get, he was, getting, he was getting stuck in, and it just, it's, maybe it just kind of just goes to show you, if, you're, if you go out with that kind of wiry attitude almost... That you are able to maybe mix it with some bigger lads. Will that be the case if they meet again? I I had a guess and maybe say it it wouldn't be, but that was kind of a sign of that Kilkenny were kind of getting stuck in and making it very, very awkward for, for Limerick. It's also I think it's important for Kilkenny to I know I know it was only a league game and I know, but to beat them in Parky Cueve and beat them in a big pitch. This wasn't a provincial ground. This was, you know, the last couple of times, the last three times they've met, they were beaten twice in Crow Park, once in Parky Cueve in the league final last year. I think that helps as well. It, it kind of takes an excuse off the table, shall we say, for Limerick, or they're better suited to whatever type of a ground or whatever. But from a Kilkenny point of view, I think they'll take a lot off, uh, a lot from it. They they also played the last fifteen minutes without TJ, which is important the fact that they were able to hold the whole thing together without him now did Limerick I'm not saying did Limerick really want to win the game but would Aaron Galan Declan Hannan Garod Hegarty and there's one one more I'm forgetting would they Keen have Lynch, all Keane Lynch like would they have all they would have all remained on the field if Limerick that's why they were playing though maybe they're maybe not like the way championship. Were championship would, would they withdraw them yeah but would Surely there's enough kind of. And this is going into another another conversation here. You you think maybe there's enough credit in the bank that they would potentially turn it around or have a couple of big plays toward the end. But Kylie actually referenced that after he said, you know, I actually got to read out read it out here. He said about a pa a pass. He said, can he give them a pass? Um, we sat and chatted there for the last 15 minutes. There's no excuse. There's just no excuse. Had we trained today, I would have expected to get three times more out of him. It's just not good enough. It's not acceptable. We know that. They know that. 
uh, they put their hand up to acknowledge that. It's just disappointed from our perspective. We have four weeks now to go and put to our shoulders to wheel. And by Jesus, we have a lot of improving to do. I just want to get to the part where he talks about the past. He said, um, if we were fatigued, you'd see it in training. And I've seen the opposite in training. But for whatever reason today, I don't know. It just wasn't there. Um, now, I'd have to say, how many times in seven or eight seasons has it not been there? Very rarely. So do they get a pass on this one? It's not the way we operate. We don't give each other passes. You can't give yourself a pass at this level of sport. If you give yourself a pass, you're expecting to get another one the next day. We know there won't be another pass the next day. It's as simple as that. So like, even he is not kind of giving them a pass. And even the language he was using about being embarrassed, like it's been an embarrassing performance. He didn't, he didn't kind of sugarcoat it really. And he didn't like like what Liam Sheedy did in Nolan Park when the Kilkenny hockey tip in 09. He didn't take the blame himself either. He kind of laid it back at the players somewhat. Um, and like I don't know, twelve months ago and after the league final against Kilkenny, Limerick were unbeatable and no one was going to beat them. No one was going to get with an asses roar them. Twelve months later, not saying they've been written off or anything like that, but there's a there's a tiny seed of doubt. And now Kylie has a stick to beat Limerick with. Um, a team that's gone for six in a row and five six in a row Munster and five in a row in Ireland. To me, it's set up absolutely perfect for them to get a massive reaction over the coming months. And they're away in Portugal, I think, this week on a holiday. Not a on a team, not a team holiday. Sorry, a team a training camp. Not a bad place to go to reset the mind and reset the focus. I'd say as well. Yeah, and um, yeah, look, we'd still imagine that they're going to be the ones climbing the steps of the Hogan later in the year. I mean, it, it's, it'd be very quick to write them off, but after starting the game so well, 1-2 to nothing ahead, to lose the remainder of the game by 13 points, that will definitely make an impact on them. Now, we see lots of comments about James Owens' referee and performance. Sadder, the Holmes also puts in here, anything to be said about the Groot Hegarty tax Limerick are paying every game. A man swings off his neck and the free gets given against Groot, pathetic referee. And that was the incident where Richie Reid came close for a tackle. For my money, James Owens got this absolutely 100 million percent. I'm going to go there. Correct. Correct. Because, yes, Reid came in close. Then there was a little bit of contact, as there is in all tackles in GEA. And for my money, Groot Hegarty put out his leg and threw Reid over his leg. And it's something we're seeing in Gaelic football all the time. Shane McGuigan did it several times against Kerry earlier in the league this year. Once the referee bought it, another time he didn't and gave a free against him. And I'm glad that uh, that James Owen saw this because it was a free for Kilkenny every day of the week. Yeah, I looked. At it, I, it's kind of hard enough to see it in real time, but you look back at it a couple of times. It kind of, like at the end of the day, no real one, time was obvious. Number one, yeah, to, to you obviously because you're some sort of hurling genie. Um, <laughs> Uh, but like number one, whatever about the trip, he pegs him to the ground as well. And you can't throw someone away or whatever, no matter what type of contact you're getting. Um, and yeah, when you look back at it, he puts his leg out almost to, to yeah, basically like it's like something you do in a schoolyard when you were twelve or thirteen, isn't it? To try and get a lad onto the ground or something like that or embarrass someone. But that's it. It looks um, it, it's definitely something I'd say that's been looked at by the referees. And James Owens was in no doubt about it. Now, some of the other frees, though, that were given, um, and they were kind of given to Kilkenny at kind of times when they were struggling to get scores from play, were, I would say, of the soft variety, uh, to, say, to say the least. But, um, you know, I, I, would, I would definitely agree with you on that Hegarty one. It was, it was a Kilkenny free every day of the week. Um, I see a comment here from Ace Holly 180. Is the absence of Caroline Kerr the factor? I can't imagine that it is. It, um, I, I don't like. I don't think. Um, I don't think we can really judge that until the end of the championship. How many um, points is she good for in a game? <laughs> well, she doesn't I look any. She doesn't put any over the bar anyway. Yeah, look, well, obviously, um, I'm being facetious there, but I don't think that a team can all of a sudden, in the space of a couple of months, just you know, come up with a performance like that, and that's what we're going to see going forward. L let's let's be clear about it. It was a big non-performance for them. Some of their players look stuck to the ground. Like, is that an SNC thing, or are we going to say that's some sort of a psychological thing? They're missing five lads who probably will start also. So I just think it's a case of let's not get carried away. No, I wouldn't. Um, and I know from uh, from reading Bernard Brogan's book that like they got to a point with their psychology where Kev McMenamin essentially took it on, and they had a player. It was player led. Um, because they obviously felt they were in a pretty good place um, upstairs. I'd imagine Limerick are in a fairly good place as well. 
Um, I'm sure potentially that if needs be that she's been tapped into, um, you know, for one to ones and stuff like that. So I wouldn't be reading that much into that, to be honest with you. Sad at home says, Shane, if someone puts their arms around your neck, what would you do? But I think he got close and it was only when he's been tugged around that he was holding on to Hegarty then and maybe grabbed him around the neck if you feel that he grabbed him there. I'm not entirely sure he did. But to me, it's clear. And like, Hegarty's not the only ever player to do it. And he had a good game, I mean, relative to, to his teammates. And he's been in hurler of the year form. So look, we talk about him very positively so much. But nah, for me, all day it's a free against him. And that needs to be stamped out straight away. Just forwards, just tr well, forwards or backs, just to come up against the tackler and just throw him over their leg. Nah, don't like it. Yeah, no, and I think it's um, it's something that he's going to have to be very aware of now because that was obviously um, very well highlighted on Saturday and it's something that he won't get away with um, from now on. So I'd imagine it's something he's going he's gonna to have to cut out. He's going to have to find a different way, whether it's turn backwards and give a pass backwards or find a different way to get around his man than that. Yeah. Just wondering, is there anything else that we haven't covered in this particular match? Um, Just... I, like I, I'm, and I, I don't know if there's any like reason to this now, but like even you know how uh, publicised the Kyle Hayes case was during the week, does that have a bit of a tax tax and effect? Maybe a couple a couple of days later, I, I'm I'm not I'm not sure really, but I'm sure that's that's something that they were all looking at very very closely, and obviously it's probably something they were emotionally invested in as well. Um, and it's something that John Kiley had and Declan Hannum would have had to deal with at the, the Munster launch last week. And it was the first question that TG4 asked John Kiley last Saturday as well. So maybe that kind of played into it as well. But um, a couple, just a couple of notes. I think it was important for Kilkenny to stop the rot against Limerick because there had been a rot basically since that 2019 semi final. But also, if you look at how uh, Limerick under John Kiley have dealt with defeats and what the reaction has been to defeats. Beaten by Kilkenny in 2019, don't lose another championship game till um, a meaningful championship game, shall we say, till they play Clare last year. How did they react to that feat? defeat? They went on and won um, five in a row in Munster and four All Ireland. So, like, I think I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing for Limerick to be kind of resetting now at this stage. Mm, okay, okay. Uh, Carl O'Neill is to me. I don't see. I don't see how they're going to leave him out of the team. But the place where he get into the team assuming Kyle Hayes is back and obviously they're going to trust in Hannon and, and Burns to get their usual form back. The place where there's probably a position is in the full forward line, but that's probably the one area where I wouldn't play him anywhere. Like I'd play him anywhere between five and 12. I'm not sure I'd play him as someone who's, you know, really far up the field, but maybe they'd even give him the Peter Casey role. Yeah, that, that would have been the role I would have kind of thought. Um, he's probably hurt you most from probably 80 yards or so. That's he's just such a, He's such a kind of lazy strike and is able to put the ball over from distance. That would probably be where I'd be looking at him. It'd be interesting to see if they appeal the, the Peter Casey read. To, to me now, that was pretty clear cut. Um, and you can say, I, I just think it's gas. Like I, I thought Paddy Deegan barely touched him now just before that, to be honest, which I know they were having, there was a small bit of verbal between the two of them. I thought he, he barely touched him. And I thought Casey swung back and he would have heard the contact he made in his hand. And there was obviously blood coming out of Deegan's hand, which made it probably look worse when James, uh, not look worse, it made it look bad as it was when James Owens went into to kind of uh, officiate on it. But uh, to me, like... Yeah, he, he's going to be missing the first day against Clare. I, I don't see how else he wouldn't be. Mm, okay, we'll keep the comments in. Let us know what you think. There's so many comments coming in today, which is great to see. We always like to, to get your opinions. We definitely don't know at all. Uh, Leash beat down in the 2A semi-final. 124 to 13 points. So this was very comfortable for a finish. Um, they'll play Carlo in the final now, and it means Division 1B for Leash next year. Aaron Dunphy scored seven points and whatever bit of a revival that down were producing in the second half, a goal from Paddy Purcell put that to bed. So that will actually be a nice little tasty final leash Carlo coming up in the Division 2A. Yeah, and Carlo get home advantage um, by virtue of finishing top of the table, which is which is great. We always yeah. think there should there should be a reward for finishing top of the table. And obviously, Leash have gotten another game under their belts. Um, I, I wouldn't... I know this was comprehensive and it was, you know, 14 point win or whatever, but down have actually been, down have been flying throughout the league and got some big, big results. Um, they're obviously beaten in a two A final a couple of years ago by Westmead. Um, but like, I think Ro Ronan Sheen, I think is, 
I think John Kiley's the only inter-county manager, um, let's say, in service longer than him at the minute. And he has turned things upside down um, in, in down in down like they're like they're very consistent force and they'll be hoping to leave a mark at McDonough Cup level this year um, and from a leash point of view uh, they're obviously going to be in 1A next year they're going to be part of that seven teams and that's very very big for them and they're coming into that McDonough in um, fairly rude health as well yeah you, you just mentioned there you know like I'm thinking energy and turning things around and all this kind of stuff Simon Harris's quote over the weekend, the new leader, of course, Fina Gale, and he was talking about, you think this party, you know, hasn't shown energy? Well, you ain't seen nothing yet. And then he was just like, oh, no, what have I just said? It just came out the wrong way. I think it was one of, it's one of the funniest quotes I've seen in a long, long time. But uh, that's, that's much ado about nothing because we're here to talk about GA. Uh, the Division 2B semi-final, Derry are already waiting in the final, but Tyrone got five goals and beat Donegal in Letterkenny. That was 5 9 to 3 14. Bit of a surprise there, Shane, on now. That would, Donegal would have been expected to come through in that now. That's that's a bit of a surprise. And they'll be disappointed because they've been they've been close to getting up to 2A before. Um, and this I, I think Donegal see this is a real missed opportunity now, I have to say. Yeah, okay, okay. And then the next result you might read out there. Yeah, like. it finished Sligo 22 points, uh, Cavan won 14. So again, Cavan only came up out of 3B last year and although they're knocked out now, um, they're still making making really, really good strides and they're actually ahead of half time with, uh, with Nicky Kenny uh, on form but um, Jero Kelly Lynch by all accounts was, was key for Sligo and of course this year there's five O'Kelly Lynch brothers involved in Sligo which is, is something else. Outside of the the four dailies that are playing with the, the Clare Camogie team, including triplets, um, that and I think there's a pair. Of, there's, or I was going to say a pair of triplets. There's triplets playing with the Waterford ladies footballers as well. Um, a, f- a fair achievement for for any family to have three, four, or five involved with their county. Yeah, like Cavan are going very well for it. Like they're really upwardly mobile, and they they gave this performance. They were ahead against Sligo at half time, and they didn't have Canis Maher, didn't have my old buddy Brian Fitzgerald Breezer, and you know, the two Shanans that I would know from Kula as well, like I don't think Colm Shannon was there at all. And I think only Killian came on later on. And again, going back to the point we made last week, they didn't have a team for six years up till yeah. 2017 or 18. What a comeback this is or, or, or what progression this is. Then also Division 3B, Longford won 12, Warwickshire won 16. So Kevin McKernan, he scored seven points there. That was important. Longford were without the injured David Buckley and Charles Flynn. Uh, Paddy Lynham was unavailable and Keelan Cox was suspended. So they were down an awful lot of players there. Um, let's see. Crack of the Ash says, Owen Brassan's fears for tip last week and realised who's their six, their half back line, their midfield. Joseph Nash says, Leash need to be back up playing the big teams. They do indeed. Do you know, what? as we go into the football here, there's a point I wanted to make to you about, you know, making the league that bit sexier. And normally I don't like talking about these topics because I think they're more winter fodder. But like, like we can't go from year to year talking about who wants to be in a league final and who doesn't be. We just need everyone to want to be in a league final and make these competitions meaningful. And we're wondering, can we believe what we saw from from the teams in the semi final this weekend? Can we believe what we saw in the football league over the weekend? Obviously, look, we, we'll quickly agree that the preseason competitions have to go. But is there a case now to be made that because there's so much, so many football games? And their season probably lasts a bit longer. And there's more counties that are that really focus on Gaelic football in the club scene. Should we start the football Gaelic football league maybe three weeks before we start the hurling league, and let it finish? Like okay, so let's say we play the football league, it finishes, and then there's three weeks or four weeks until the football championship starts. So you've staggered the start of the hurling league maybe what would be week four. So you've three rounds of football gone. Then you play the hurling and allow that to finish, and kind of bridge that three-week gap between the football league ending and the football championship starting. So you've okay. still got EA front and center, right? And then, okay, the hurling, once the league final is played, there's an, they won't start the championship for at least another three weeks. And But the GA will still be front and center because the football championship will start. And then you come back and the, three weeks later and the hurling starts again. So you've just got, you've got no sort of blank period at all the football teams can concentrate on the league, know that they'll get at least three weeks off. The hurling teams then the exact same. And we won't have these frustrating situations of not knowing if a team is interested in the competition or not. 
Yeah, and that's all to do with proximity, isn't it? So if you take the, if you take that over the proximity of a league final or league semi final to the championship, um, listen, it's it, it's hard to find more weeks in the calendar, but there's definitely um there's definitely a lot a lot to be said about getting rid of the preseason competitions. The only thing I will say, and I had a good chat with uh with Mike Finnerty about this yesterday up in Clonus, uh, I like look at the appetite there is for people to attend these preseason games, right? So. I think, and there's probably a fair, um, fair bit of fact in this. Provincial councils would there be a decent bit of kind of uh, money into the coffers as a result of preseason competitions, and I know some of it goes to the hardship fund that the GA have as well for players that are maybe out of pocket through injuries and stuff like that. But even streaming services, th- there's a lot of finance involved, even in those opening four or five weeks of pre-season competitions because there's a massive appetite there for it. Um, so it could be difficult to get them to relinquish that. And that's just the facts of it because how difficult is it to get provincial councils to relinquish the, you know, the provinces, the championship provinces, very, very difficult because it's, you know, that's their baby almost. So that would be something, that would be definitely be a bridge that would have to be crossed. But there's absolutely no reason why starting the football earlier, why the 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 clamor for preseason competition wouldn't be the clamor for the first two or three rounds of the league. Absolutely no reason whatsoever. And if you leave, like Dublin and Derry uh, are both going to be out this Sunday, and like it's ju- it is just it's it's getting too close for them now to uh, to their championships, and they're almost been punished. Why should you punish a high achiever? You should never punish a high achiever or someone that gets that wants to get to a final and wants to win trophies. They should never be punished. And I'm not saying they are, but Mayo definitely were last year, and they were dumped out of Connacht a week later um, after playing a league final and going up to Dublin and all the hoo ha around that. And then seven days later, Ross Common dumped them out. That just should, to me, should never be the scenario. So the only way to buy weeks back is cold pre-season competitions but as I said I do think that you'd be met with a small bit of resistance not from me or you or a lot of players or anything like that but I think you will be met with some resistance by provincial councils the bean counters but then again like <laughs> if, you, if you look at one of the pre-season competitions this year the final and maybe even a couple of games weren't played yeah. because of the weather being that's the true yeah that's yeah. true oh, Monster. yeah some of the division one results from the weekend Derry beat Ross Common 219 to 1-9 and like Davy Burke's team, they they cut the deficit to one eight to one seven early in the second half, and they lost the remainder of the game one eleven to one twelve. Their goal came from a mistake. You saw the the ball bounce over the keeper, and then the Smith knocked it into the net. So just not like I think Davy Burke said it was a good fifty minutes from his team, but they petered out after that. But he is just trying to right the ship a little bit because they've had a ropey run. They have had a ropey run, and um, he was trying to come up with positives. Um, like when you're beaten by 13 points, uh, it's hard enough to find the positives. Um, they were competitive for a good while. He also came out uh, and said it was a bit of a witch hunt against uh, Carl Heenan over that stamp. Like, I don't know. Jeez, it looked it looked pretty clear cut to me now, to be honest with you. And I think he's a, it's a one match ban that 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 he's gotten. So like it it could have been to me, it could have been a, a good bit worse. And you understand him defending his player though. Like I, yeah, it's a red card and there's no there's no debate. But you can understand no. that he has to develop or you know defend his player. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it just I don't know. I, I don't, it's kind of defending the indefensible as well. You can't you can't defend defend it too much, like because I don't think there's much to defend. But isn't this what always happens in sport? Whether you're talking about Klopp or Guardiola or whatever, it's just what teams do. Because you want to feel that the players have your back and you want to feel, as a player, the manager has my back. Yeah, true enough, yeah. Listen, if I was in that scenario, I'd be 100% back in the players. As long as they 100% back me, I will 100% go, go to the weld with them like and absolutely back them to the hilt. Yeah, okay. Well, some of the other results then. Dublin 5-18, Tyrone 12. 21-point defeat. And I know you can say... When Tyrone won the All Ireland, they'd conceded it was six goals against Kerry in a late round league yeah. game, and it looked awful. But um, Dublin looking to win a first league under Desi Farrell, and their Leinster campaign starts on April 14th. But let's be honest, the league final is going to be more difficult for them. They were able to take off Conor Callan, Brian Fenton, Kieran Kilkenny, all well before full time. Do you think, like, do you read too much into this? Um, the only thing you'd read into it is that Dublin are playing as well as they have at any stage, you'd say, in the last... God, are they are playing as well as they've played in any stage in the last decade, like when you take the first probably two league games out of it. And they're playing what's brilliant football 
to watching the eyes. It's a ma- it's a matter of whether they're able to sustain it now. Um, interesting. Desi Farrell said that none of the none of the nine uh, time All Ireland winners will be featured in the final. James McCarthy has a couple of knocks. Um, it's with Mick Fitzsimons just training away, and I believe um, Stephen Cluxton played a league game and goals for Parnells yesterday, Division Two. Um, so they'll they'll all be back as well. But it, like. I remember being in Conlitz Park when Kildare turned them over in Division One, and that kind of led to their relegation. And there was a lot of new faces that were playing that day. That you're kind of thinking, "Oh, will these boys be able to swim with the sharks?" And they've persisted with them. And now you have um, you have lads that are thriving um, at the highest level. And it, maybe it's just a matter of sinking a couple of times and been exposed to it, and eventually, like. To just, to just like the likes of Key Murphy and many, many more kind of new faces like that. Sean Bugler even has kind of taken his football, his game to another level as well. So they're in a really good spot, um, and they're in a far better spot to when McCarthy retires and when Cluxton retires and when Fitzsimon Fitzsimons retires. They look like they'll be in a far better spot than maybe we thought they would be. Yeah, and Colin Baskell scored two three. Larkin O'Dell one two. Kerry beat Galway, and for long spells it looked like it was routine enough. But a late goal from Tom O'Callaghan made it a little bit of a squeaky bum time. I thought Killian Splann looked really um, nippy in this game. He scored four points. One was a free. Sean O'Shea scored four, and then um, is it Adam Heinrich is the name of the player? And you can't help. He scored a point. You can't help but think was that point a Heinrich maneuver? Ah. Armin, is it not? Armin, Armin, sorry. Yeah, like Armin Tamzarian. I got sent a message yeah, yeah, yeah. to Principal Skinner's... Um, a re- lot of the re- older re- viewers re- won't know who Armin Tamzarian is. Yeah, no. Um, Principal Skinner um, from uh, from The Simpsons, of course. Someone sent me that last night. Yeah, the, the good old Heinrich. Yeah, mad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Galway, they're just down so many players. And it's not like Park Joyce was looking for excuses afterwards, but they... Like if they're going to have a big year, they need Comer, Walsh, Kelly back. They need them all there. But um, what is it me or did he sounded quite downbeat even about when the timelines of when those guys yeah, are going to be did, back as well, yeah. didn't he? Which yeah, is yeah. um, which is very very worrying because and the thing and I think I've said this to you before about Comer as well. Comer's best seasons are un- uninterrupted seasons where he's just played and played and played and he plays himself into a level of form like twenty twenty two. Um, he was at a level. He was nearly playing the whole year. Last year, I think he was interrupted during the league, wasn't he? Um, mm. And even a couple of years before that, he was. And it's going to be the same this year. So even if they do get back, and it's all guaranteed that they're going to be back, um, they're going to be under a bit of pressure and they're going to have to play themselves into form in big games. And that that's just very, very difficult thing to do. What did you make of this towards the very end of the game when uh, Paul Conroy and Adrian Splank got into it? The jersey been absolutely ripped off him Paul Conroy doesn't look that too that fussed at all he isn't really reacting to it so much do you see that as a, a red card offense yellow card offense or uh, an offense against fashion <laughs> it's like what Hulk Hogan used to do back in the back in the days and he come in <laughs> just and he start going like this um but like as, as someone mentioned to me before for some of those bigger counties and wealthier counties, it's probably grand to just ring O'Neill's and get a replacement. Um, for some counties that are on the breadline, a small bit, it might it mightn't be that simple. And I know in clubs you've seen I've seen where jerseys have been ripped or whatever, and uh, you're nearly sewing them back together, or somebody is wearing um, a jersey from a different set or something like that. I, I definitely think they're going to have to bring it in because it's like lads lads know that you know if hands go above shoulders here. You know, it could easily be a striker move and it could be given a red card. So it's almost like they just grab the jersey. Now, you can grab the Orga Retro as hard as you want. That won't rip. But some, no. but some some, of the other ones, not so sure. So it's um, it's probably something that they're going to have to bring in some sort of a rule around it because it's like the default now. How many times have you seen David Clifford involved and his jersey ripped as well? Lads just grab him. They don't go around the head or around the neck because they know they'll be penalised for it or they're likely to be. So some sort of, uh, some sort of a rule or something is going to have to be brought in there, I'd say. Yeah, and you were at Clonus to see Mayo beat Monaghan 2.13 to 1.13. Matty Rowan's goal laid on turned it around. Like, Monaghan had sort of bucked the, the trend in form that they've had recently. Yeah, no, I, I thought Monaghan were good against Tyrone now, I have to say as well. Um, And they were well in that at the end. And they're missing a hell of a lot of lads. And Vinny Corey, just relentless was the word he used for their injury list. And it grew yesterday, unfortunately, because uh, Michal Bannigan, who was probably their best player, he went off just after setting up a goal. 
Um, he's very good, isn't he? He's a, he's, really brilliant, he's a brilliant player. He kicked a lovely couple of scores yesterday. He was treading some balls through as well. So they ended up actually finishing with 13 players, but Andrew Woods got a straight red in the 23rd minute for what looked like a strike in action. Um, and he'll miss the preliminary round against Cavan as a result of that. Desi Ward pulled up with a hamstring injury. Killian Lavelle had an eye injury, which I don't think is serious. And as I said, Michal Bannigan went off. They, who else are, are they missing? Um, Conor McManus was missing yesterday, but he'd be back fit. Jack McCarron was tight. He was missing as well. Um, Did you bring up Rory Began being in the NFL again? I, I didn't because it seems, to be brought up, it seems to be brought up every week. But like it looks like, by all accounts, that they're going to be without him, without him for the foreseeable future by looks at him because he's been signed up um to an agent asked me i don't think it's the high profile kicking agent that that charlie smith was signed up to but he's been signed up like it it looks for all the world like there's going to be some contracts drawn out from from everything you're kind of seeing and hearing and how impressive they're, they've been as well um but from a monitor point of view i still think monitor will will tip away come summertime um Carl O'Connell is back. Is, is got another full game under his belt yesterday. Conor McCarthy very quiet yesterday, but um, I think it was there was nothing to play for really, really in the game. It was just kind of a matter of getting through it. They got Sean Jones back onto the pitch, um, but they have a fair old injury list that they're going to have to get over. Stephen, Stephen O'Hanlon hasn't played much since that Dublin game, um, and the flip like they were actually very very good and controlled the game despite being down to fourteen men, and were probably the better team overall. Uh, I think Matthew Ruan was the only one to kick a point from play for Mayo up until like the 62nd minute or something like that. They brought on Killian O'Connor for a good ball and they helped to, to turn the tide a small bit. But eventually, Monaghan just got overran as a result of... Um, when Bannigan went off, Monaghan used their six subs. So there's only 13 on the pitch at the end. And obviously, like two people, um, as regards numerical uh, disadvantage, is going to eventually tell. And it did at the end. Mayo were far from impressive now I have to say um, wasn't uh, wasn't particularly good on the eye even like I thought their full back line was opened up a couple of times David Garland who wouldn't be a particularly big player for Mana and he came in just before half time and he won two high balls should have had a penalty in the 60 minute as well a penalty and a black card that would have evened things up Rory Brickenden definitely looked to foul him inside the area and kind of looked like he'd pulled him down penalty wasn't given um, and it was just a free Um Mayo scored the last one too to, to win the game with Parag O'Hara kicking the last point but they weren't yeah I definitely wasn't blown away by them um, Kevin McStay said they were close to their top top level but I don't think they were within a million miles to be honest with you one thing that was of note uh, yesterday Aidan O'Shea made his 185th competitive appearance for Mayo and like you know Shano when you're up in Crow Park you're on level 7 you're looking down everyone kind of looks kind of it's like the Father Ted thing everybody's far away like do you know what I mean but Clonus you're much closer to him like he is so, he's so big like he's huge and to cover the ground that he covers and to have played the amount of games nearly consecutively that he has since I think his debut was 2009 is is outstanding really and I know he's I know he's much maligned but he's been some service to Mayo yeah I think Niall Morgan might have made his 175th appearance for Tyrone over the weekend and Ben Brosnan did the same I think didn't he didn't he become Wexford most cap player I think could have been 175 he overtook Brian Malone I think at the weekend as well yeah something like that I'll just bring back up the GA league tables here really good service on X um, so Derry and Dublin they finished first and second then meeting that league final uh, Kerry on 10 points just missing out behind Dublin Mayo and Tyrone, eight points and six. Galway, five, I'd say, given all their injury issues, they won't be overly concerned about that. And Ross Common and Monaghan will drop down. And for Monaghan, it's six defeats in a row after beating Dublin the first day out. If you were told that after yeah. one game that you'd see them there, you'd be shocked. And Division Two, Donegal and Armagh, they're going to be in a league final. They're both, well, actually, Donegal are undefeated. Um, Armagh, they lost, uh, oh, actually, sorry, they drew, drew a couple of games. So both of those teams are undefeated. Uh, Fermanagh and Kildare, they're dropping out of the division. But um, just in terms of the results, we'll just go through them there. Cavan 113, Fermanagh 214, Cork 216, Armagh 216. And there was that late Stephen Sherlock score that, you know, is up for debate. Kildare 12 points. So Kildare continue their rotten run, Loud 112. And then Donegal 118, Mead 110. So as I said, Donegal are unbeaten throughout the whole thing. But you just wonder, given that it was a dead rubber, look, we'll, we'll bring up the table here again. There were no, there was no doubt that they weren't going to get through to the final. They're picking up injuries to Paddy McBearty yeah. and Ryan McHugh. We're not far off the championship. 
I mean, like, how many of your frontline players? I know you want to keep form and all that kind of stuff, but lads like that, it's easy to be wise after the event, but you feel like, geez, you need to wrap lads up and, you know, wrap them up in cotton wool. Yeah, it is a real kind of juggling act, isn't it? And Vinnie Corey was saying the same yesterday. Like, you need, he needed to get some minutes into Sean Jones. He pulled him after about 48 minutes. Um, but, like, he actually said that because it was a, a dead rubber, basically, he would have loved if they were allowed to use 10, 10 subs or something like that, maybe. To, so you're not pushing lads that extra, maybe five minutes when they're going into that kind of red zone at the end of a game where you're likely to pick up an knock that you can just bring in a fresh, fresh pair of legs or whatever. Um, the big takeaway for me from Division 2 is, um, you know, there was all the hoo-ha about Mickey Hart leaving Loud. And you look at, you know, Loud, Loud stayed up. Joe Brennan has come in there and done what looks like a masterful job so far. Look at their plus 20 having lost, um, having lost four games. Like, they were beaten uh, a point, I think, by Armagh the first day. Fair enough, Donegal beat them by five. Um, they were beaten. Uh, I forget who was against. It was three nine to two thirteen in another game. Like they've been really, really close. They could easily be third or fourth um, in that in that group. But just with Hart and Gavin Devlin and leaving, you kind of maybe thinking, oh, maybe Lau will kind of slip back down or whatever. So it was crucial for them to hold on to to their Division Two status, and it was a real. Um, a real consistent campaign the whole way through. So I again I definitely tip my cap to Joe Brennan there coming in like his debut year inter county level. Um and it looks like they'll give Leinster a good kind of a good kind of bash against this year. But next year or a, a good bash again this year, but next year it's crucial that they're in division two that they can keep growing and not slipping down the divisions. Yeah, division three then we're seeing down in Westmead heading for um the league final Wicklow and Limerick, they're dropping down, but just in terms of the results, Antrim 114, Wicklow 14, down 315, Clare 110. And obviously, Clare will will still agonise over what happened against Westmead when they were probably very harshly done by Offaly 110, Limerick 12 points, Sligo 114, Westmead 11. And then Division 4, Carlow 117, um, London 110. I'll just bring up the table there. Waterford 9 points, Leash 519. That's a fairly comprehensive one. Uh, Wexford 218, Longford 29. And of course, um, after that game, what you, you, you look at Wexford like that late penalty incident away to Leitrim that probably cost them big time because Leitrim beat Tipperary to guarantee that they're going to be up there in the top two and heading for that league final. Andy Moore was there saying, I heard a lot of noise during the week about killing league finals, they can kill them all they want for division one and two, but they won't be killing them for divisions three and four. Do you agree with that point? Um, yeah, I like, I think the importance of them for teams that are a bit off Broadway or counties that are a bit off Broadway, like it'll be huge. I, I remember we did a live show for the Independent in the Crow Park Hotel the last time Leitrim were in Division 4, uh, Division 4 final when Terry Highland was over them and there was a massive crowd up for it and it's a big, like how often do Leitrim play in Crow Park? Like it is, it's a big thing and playing a final and having the chance to win Silver Air is a big thing for them. So yeah, he, he probably has a point there. While mm. maybe you could say Division, the Division 1 final or potentially Division 2 final particularly with Jim McGuinness's injuries it doesn't maybe have as much importance for them I think it has massive importance particularly for the teams uh, in the Division 3 and even more so in Division 4 just funny you mentioned there Clare will feel very disappointed by that incident in Mullingar and as you said that kind of nearly decided who was going to be um, in the top two or who's going to be promoted in Division 3. And similarly for Wexford, like that far skill call in Carrigan Shannon, you know, a good few weeks ago has come back to, to bite um, Wexford in the ass, unfortunately, and Leitrim are the ones that are gone up. And I, I wasn't aware of it, Chano, as well. And I don't know if, if he's only opted out in recent weeks or he's been out for the whole league. But Keith Byrne not been involved when with Leitrim and for them still to be promoted. I believe Ryan O'Rourke ripped it up yesterday and has been doing so for most of the league. But for Leitrim to be promoted without one of their best is, you know, it's yet another feather in their cap. Yeah. And by the way, there's a, a live show coming up in the Dome in Thurless uh, before the Hurland Championship. This is presented by Sean Tracy's GA. Uh, John Milan, Kieran Carey, Eddie Brennan, Seamus Callan, they're all going to be there. You'll be able to scan the QR code there or head to the head to our X account and you'll find a link to where you can buy. I hope there's there. lots of tip folk and turtles folk showing up to defend your honor because it's kind of it's kind of set up perfectly. Um because like Tipperary are coming in, there's a little bit of, there'll be a little bit of John, a little bit of needle, 
Um, it's all perfect, you know, a couple of weeks before the championship starts. So I hope there's plenty of tip. I, I, if I say something, the, the stage could be stormed. You just, you just never know. <laughs> and I'll have to defend you and protect you. But um, <laughs> our, what about our goal of the week? We, we actually, um, I don't think we did one last week. But anyway, let's no. do it this week. Um, looking at the Kilkenny game. Oh, like I know they gave TJ Reid man of the match on the telly. He was he was good. He was good, all right. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. I don't know if he's up in he's a goat in general, but whether he's goat of the week, I'm not so sure. I'd probably give it to someone like like Jordan Malai. I'd say just a fella thrown in, big responsibility, pick up Keen Lynch. And you could say maybe Keen Lynch wasn't moving like he normally would be, but um, he took to it like a duck to water. So yeah, be Jordan Malai for me. I thought he was. He not only did he spoil. Key Lynch, but he also had a big bear at the other end of the pitch as well. Yeah, even though, and I said earlier, he didn't probably play a 70 minute performance. I'd say David Fitzgerald, he'd probably right, be right up there. And then Colin Gaskell scoring 2 3. That was pretty uh, impressive. Yeah, big time. And on the football front, um, from the game I was at, I probably would have given it to Michal Bannigan, even though he had to kind of limp off at the end. He was probably Monaghan's best player. Me, me, Michal Bannigan or, or Matty Ryan, who kind of kept Mayo taking over when very few other lads did. And just on that as well, like Mayo had nearly their starting attack playing yesterday, maybe outside of Killian O'Connor. Tommy Conroy, Aidan O'Shea, um, Ryan O'Donoghue, all in around the goals at different times. And they're misfiring at the minute. Um, Big time. Now, this time last year, they were probably they were probably firing on all cylinders and then maybe didn't deliver come championship time. So... Maybe they're they're playing the long game, but they're definitely not putting up a, as high a scores as they'd like to be from play anyway, definitely. Okay, well, that's pretty much it from the show. A reminder once more that we're brought to you by ogreretro.com. Use the promo code OURGAME and you'll get 15% off. By the way, if you want audio podcasts, written columns, uh, two-minute tactics videos, coaching clinic stuff, head to patreon.com forward slash OURGAME. That's it, Michael. We'll chat to you again later in the week. Cheers, channel.